Welcome to The Shed Wireless, a podcast for shedders. Produced by the Australian Men's Shed Association and hosted by John Paul Young. Yeah, there's something for you at the Men's Shed. Hello, shedders. Wherever you're listening around Australia and around the globe, it's great to have you here as part of of the Shed Wireless. Did you know this is the 25th episode of the podcast? We're up to episode four in season three, and that is something to celebrate. And here's some more good news. The Shed Wireless recently ranked number 12 in a list of top Australian podcasts you must follow in 2021 by Feedspot. I just think that's fantastic. I'm over the moon. And a big hello to you if you're listening on a community radio station too. Uh, We've got a growing number of stations playing the show now which is just fabulous the shed wireless a podcast for shedders produced by the australian men's shed association across australia and around the world yeah there's something for you at the men's shed Here's what you can look forward to in this episode. On the tools, we're looking at a machine that saves fingers. If you love woodwork, you'll definitely want to hear about the saw stop. And there's a demonstration that involves a frankfurt rather than a finger. Interesting. Our special guest is the Governor-General of Australia, His Excellency David Hurley. We'll put another Aussie men's shed under the spotlight. This one's in Western Australia. Rip Woodchip is feeling a chill in his bones. Like most of us, no doubt. And it's the final instalment of our Ask the Doc series on pain management. In particular, we've been looking into opioid pain medications, otherwise known as opiates. What if you have chronic pain and your doctor wants you to try something new? Thankfully, you won't have to suffer in silence. That's coming up in Ask the Doc a bit later in the podcast. On the tools. On the shed wireless. I've got to tell you, the tool we're looking at today is pretty incredible. It's called a saw stop. It basically prevents you losing a finger. And it does this by shutting down the blade 10 times faster than an airbag goes off in a car crash. Pretty impressive. We're talking five thousandths of a second. Rather than put his own finger on the line to put this machine to the test, and who'd blame him, Marty Lease from the Australian Men's Shed Association has a Frankfurt to prove it. I'll bet you do, Marty. I'm all ears. Thanks, JP. Today we are down at the shed again and we are staying on the work, health and safety theme as we have in the past few episodes. This particular shed purchased one of these saw stops based on the fact that there was an incident at the shed. Now, it was, the finger wasn't completely lost from what I know, but uh, it it was a, a, a near, a very, very, very close near miss. So he didn't actually quite lose the whole finger, but uh, yeah, so they, they did manage to save it, thank God. I'm just going to move over here and talk to Paul from the shed. He's one of the, the blokes from, from the shed here. And um, from this little incident, you, you guys have, have uh, put together this little award. I'm going to take some photos of this and put it on our the shed online. But um, we've got the Safe Shedder of the Year Award, which is actually a, um, it's a, it's a plaque. It's got the, the blade with one of the, these, um, one of these breaks from the saw stop on it. And uh, this has got, uh, we've got Paul Blanksby on 2018 was presented, presented with this award. Michael Croft, 2019. Ian Jackson in 2020. So how, how did this award come about, mate? Well, this came about after the incident and we decided that uh, we did not want, we wanted to draw a line in the sand that we didn't want to have any more incidents like this. Uh, so as you have seen and you'll see on your photos that on the reverse side of the, the uh, award, it says, uh, I bled for the shed. And what we don't want to do is have any more people bleeding in our shed. So at our uh, Spanner in the Works um, uh, week we had uh, in, in Helensburg with about 85 men from various sheds attending, uh, Carbotech very kindly did a demonstration of the abilities of this saw and uh, we rescued the blade and the and the break from that demonstration and from it we created this Safe Shedder of the Year award and um, what we do each year towards the end of the year we go around and we just informally ask the guys who they think best exemplifies and demonstrates the safety keeping people safe within our shed and uh, that's how they get uh, get awarded that that uh, that award. Okay, we're going to move over to check out this contraption now and talk to Mark Thomas. Uh, Mark, 
you've been involved with these things for a while. You know the ins and outs of them. Um, definitely a, a I wouldn't say a lifesaver, but a finger saver. When did they come about? When did these when did these get invented? Uh, they were invented by Dr. Stephen Gass uh, in 19, uh, 1999. Uh, the first one was um, built in um, 2000, uh, 2004, I think it was. And it, he only invented the, the brake mechanism itself. Uh, he presented it to other manufacturers um, to place it into their saws. Um, they didn't want to do that, so he built his own table saws. Tell us, what actually is the saw stop? Saw stop itself, it's a, a brake mechanism that will, um, once it's uh, touched by a finger, and how that uh, indicates that it's been touched is by, there's an electrical charge uh, running through the blade itself. It's only very faint, uh, faint um, so it will um, activate within five thousandths of a second. Uh, so 10 times faster than an airbag in a car. It's, it's instant, you don't see it happening. Um, and what it does, the brake will implode into the brake itself, uh, the brake will implode into the blade and drop down straight away. They made it drop down so people who may faint, um, so they don't fall out onto the blade and then cut themselves again. So, and all you'll get from that is a little scratch. Um, I actually push it through very fast so I can actually get uh, a good mark on because I test it with a sausage uh, and not with my fingers um, to demonstrate. Um, it makes life really easy. So I've had instances where in schools where, where teachers have actually um, have actually touched the blade um, and it stopped. Wow. So how fast does the blade spin? Uh, normal blade, um, what is it, uh, 5,000 uh, RPMs. So it's fairly quick. So how the hell do you stop a blade going that fast? Uh, in the the brake in the brake mechanism itself, there's a little capacitor um, that acts as a gives it a little bit of explosion and a industrial spring that um, helps it propel it uh, that quick. Propel what? What 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 actually stops the blade? The actual aluminium, uh, the aluminium cartridge which is on the on the brake itself, and which you'll see photos of it. Um, gets exploded out and impacts into the blade. So the blade, because it's uh, got carbide teeth, it will bite into the, the, the block uh, and stop it. So with that impact uh, onto blade, it takes it off its uh, levers and drops it down straight away. Have you sold many of these to sheds across the country, do you know of? Uh, we've sold quite a few. There are still some reluctant in doing it, I think mainly because of the, they feel that it's uh, the added cost of uh, replacing a brake is expensive, um, but it's actually not. I don't have many sheds firing the blade, the blade brake off accidentally. Um, just the old trainer fort just has to change slightly. Uh, any conductive material, um, because that will absorb some of the charge, because uh, you're touching it, um, will activate the brake. So, okay, so once the brake's activated as, an, as a near miss or an incident, whatever, the brake's activated, the whole mechanism stuffed, is the blade stuffed? What, what is this whole saw stuffed? What's the go? No, the saw isn't stuffed. Um, all it does, you can take the, the bl blade and the brake off. Um, you'll have to uh, replace the brake on it. Uh, you don't have a choice in that. Um, but and, and how much is a brake to replace? Uh, the brake is only 130 bucks. Um, not, not much of a price for a, a saved finger. Like the ambulance is going to cost you more than that, isn't it? The ambulance, uh, it's not just that um, monetary value. It's a lifetime of um, not having to deal with a finger. You'll get a scratch. You'll have a good memory of it happening. Um, but And you may need to change your undies but, uh, yeah. after it goes off, but it's, it's fine. You're backed away. Within a couple of minutes, you can reset it again and away you go. Mark's got the, the saw all set up there. He's got a, a block of wood with a with a frankfurt on. Is there any particular frankfurt you need to do to, to do this demonstration, or is it going to be a Kransky, a normal everyday frankfurt? Can it be a can it be a sausage, for instance? It can be a sausage. It can be anything. It's just my lunch after this demonstration. That's all. Right. We'll try not to make too much of a mess of it then. Right. So, mate, you were just showing me a second ago too. It's something about the conductivity. So that the frankfurt itself, sitting there touching the blade, will not set it off. But as soon as you touch that, that will actually That'll, that'll indicate that um, you're drawing some of that electrical charge. So at the moment, I've got the Frankfurt touching the blade and it indicates on the light system that everything is good. 
Okay, so even if you have wet material, as long as you're not touching that wet material, that's a conductive material, it will not go off unless you're touching it. So I'm going to touch it now and the very light system will indicate that I'm... So the red light's flashing there, so indicating that, yeah, it's, a, it's an actual real finger, basically. So. Yeah, so it is very sensitive. Um, if you put a metal rule or anything like that into it and, and you're touching that item, uh, it will go off. So, and I've had rules come into my store with a little nick out of it saying that I've touched the, the blade um, because of what we used to do with the old uh, Triton saws we used to measure from the front and the back of a blade. Um, it's just the way things were done back then. So it does, but if you're touching a piece of timber and put it in there, it doesn't set it off? No, you have to be touching it. You've got to draw it, draw that um, energy out of it. So your capacitor, you absorb some of that energy. Are they still under patent? They are. The... Uh, Dr. Gass is an actual patent lawyer, so he's got that locked up for a while. Well, he did a good job. He knows his stuff, doesn't he? What a, what a smart, rich fellow. Yeah. <laughs> All right, mate, let's spark her up and have a go, eh? Let's see this thing happen. Here we go. Spark up the saw. Oh, my goodness. I just almost jumped out of my skin. Holy, I've never seen that before. That is crazy i'm shaking my there's just a tiniest little nick would probably hardly even draw blood on that on that thing the saw is the blade is completely down this the blade was probably up about three inches before would you say now it's just completely down into the machine gone you can't even see it that wow you've got to see this thing to believe it guys so you've taken the cover off i'm having a look through here and you can just see how the blades just dug straight into that aluminium break there and uh it definitely does the job so is, is the blade still going to be okay or is it you'd recommend just changing the blade or i always recommend to uh take it to a saw doctor and get it checked out um but you can still use the blade usually if you take the break off straight and don't try and wiggle it off um up and down um it normally comes off okay unbelievable well, mate, thank you very much for doing that for us today. That has definitely been an educational experience for me. Now, if any of the men sheds want a demonstration and they're unsure about it, uh, they just need to contact us and, uh, and we can come out and do a demonstration. Thanks, JPY. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Marty. What an impressive machine. If you'd like to see pics and a little video of the demo they did with the Frankfurt, you can check it out on YouTube. Just search for the Australian Men's Shed Association on YouTube or go to the Shed online. That web address is menshed.org forward slash the Shed online. You're listening to The Shed Wireless with John Paul Young. It's a podcast for shedders. So shed all your cares and woes and listen in. As you might know, the Shed Wireless was first created a bit over a year ago. It was brought to life in a backyard shed not long after this thing called COVID started shutting down sheds and life as we once knew it. In those early days of the pandemic, this brand new podcast for Shedders made a little piece of history. We had the Governor-General of Australia, His Excellency David Hurley, join us for his first ever podcast interview. He's actually a patron of the Australian Men's Shed Association and we're very proud to have him. And he's a really genuine guy and he's a bit of a deep thinker. I thought it was time to invite His Excellency back one year down the track. Lovely to meet you, Your Excellency. John Young here. Hey, John. How are you? I'm fine. Couldn't be better. Uh, Join the club. I was wondering how you have personally found the challenges and the changes that have been brought on by the pandemic. Yeah, it um, has impacted the way we work, uh, as you can understand. Um, If you look at the the sort of four areas of work uh, or in the task of being Governor General, one is the constitutional, the ceremonial, the Commander-in-Chief, this uh, ADF, and then community engagement. Mm. And as critical as the first three are, community engagement takes up sort of 85, 90% of our time. So when the pandemic hit March last year and we couldn't travel, um, that really made it, well, how do you do this job if you're not out meeting the public? And uh, so like many other organisations, we had to quickly turn around and move into the virtual world to communicate with people, keep in contact. And so we did that. 
And I think we did that quite successfully for about four or five months. Now we're back into travel since about November last year, just keeping our eye on what's happening around the country, but uh, back into a fairly busy uh, visit program again. Have you had your COVID vaccine yet? I've had my first AstraZeneca one, and I think I'm due for my second jabs next week or two. So getting close to having it completed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think the past 12 months has changed you at all? Um, maybe a bit more technical, savvy, I dare say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, not in any great sense. I mean, there's a time for a bit more time for introspection. Um, because again, in in this job, we're busy, you know, three, four, five nights a week uh, with uh, receptions or attending uh, charity dinners and or functions and presentation award nights, all those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So getting our nights back was a real shock to us. Um, I mean, what do you do at night time when you're not working? So, yeah. it, and that that gave us a bit of time, I think, for thinking about the job itself, about yeah, where we are in life, uh, the people mm-hmm. we've met, um, how do we change, does there any need to be changed the way we go about doing business? Um, so there are a lot of good conversations there, and I think, it doesn't necessarily change you, but it certainly created an opportunity to have those conversations in a, in a bit more depth and detail than uh, might normally be the case. Yeah. So you've had a bit of time to analyse your mm, what yeah. you've been through and uh, how you can improve things in the future. Yes. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I'm very conscious of the impact that lockdowns are having on people in terms of mental health and their worldview, in a sense. Uh, yep. We spoke on Friday last week with uh, Headspace and uh, and um, Red Cross down in Melbourne just to get a sense how the Melburnians and Victorians are responding to this latest lockdown. And uh, there are, I think, very important concerns with our younger generation, you know, the teenagers, final year school, uh, uh, youth and so on. And I think that's something we really need to be paying a lot of attention to and uh, making sure that they don't there's a there's a there's a concern that there's a, sig- a reasonable number we don't know the number fully of youngsters who have disengaged from secondary education and so how do we get them back into preparing them for life in the future and so on if they're not finishing their formal education so uh, and they are they are worried uncertain about what will come next, how long will this last and what are the implications for me for my future. So uh, I think those issues out there do concern me and, and you know, working with organisations that are engaged in that space is very important to us. Now, can we reminisce a little bit? I, I read that your father was a steel worker at Port Kembla and your mother worked in a grocery store. Now, would you say that was a typical sort of an upbringing back then? Oh, I reckon so, yes. Um, I mean, we... We grew up in the Illawarra, Wollongong way. Um, we're all the same there. Yeah, we uh, very, very much a multicultural community. When I went to school, you know, because we were right next door to the steelworks. So in those days, the steelworks employed over twenty thousand people, and yeah, you know, there were Yugoslavs, Greeks, Italians, Spaniards. Yeah, um, it was a real mix. So to me, it seemed perfectly normal uh, lifestyle growing up. You know, play rugby league, play cricket, go down the beach. Uh, those sorts of things. It was all nothing amazing, but we're so fortunate to have that lifestyle. Yeah, well, I do have fond memories of visiting the uh, Port Kembla Steelworks uh, when I was uh, when I was an apprentice. Right, it was uh, uh, it was part of the part of the curriculum at uh, at Tech as it was back then. It's now yes, TAFE. TAFE. Yeah. <laughs> um, I joined the army, so I didn't have to work in the steelworks. <laughs> <laughs> What do you do in the way of your hobbies or downtime when you're not being a VIP? How, how do you relax? Uh, uh, that's important. I, I, I keep fit. So in the warmer months in Canberra, I cycle uh, on a road bike and so on. Uh, and then in winter months, I go to the gym every morning and uh, spend a, you know 45 minutes for an hour there uh, because I've learned through life, you want to do these sorts of jobs and you've got to be busy, you've got to be fit. Yeah. And that's important to me. Um, Mm -hmm. if I can get nine holes of golf in once a month, I'm really thinking I'm fortunate. So my, (laughs) my golf game is not improving. 
Um, I'm a beekeeper, so I've got to look after my bees. I've got three hives. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, I've got three hives here, so they get a bit neglected at times, I'm afraid, but um, yeah, but that's important. And, and we use the honey here in the house and, and so on. Oh, terrific, but, terrific. Yeah. And then I have three adult children, so you know, keeping in contact with them as best we can. And uh, waiting for waiting for grandchildren, no doubt. Well, we have one 18 month old oh, little have boy, one? and another one due in September, first week of September. Congratulations! Thank you. No, no, That's it's real. Terrific. As I say, it's a real step change in life uh, when grandchildren come along. Now, I was just going to ask you that you joined Duntroon around 1972, was it? Yes, that's correct. Now, so that would have been at the end of the, the Vietnam War. That's right. Uh, Australia's formal commitments finished in 71 and they started uh-huh. to withdraw forces. I mean, we still had people there in 72, but they were on the on the uh, decline, you know, pulling people out over that phrase. Yeah. It must have been a very strange feeling being involved in the army at that stage because, uh, you know, public opinion mm. was very divided you know, in, in those days with the war effort. Certainly was. Um, so when I was a kid at Duntroon, um, you were conscious of it because, you, you know, in 71 I was a high school kid and uh, so you are listening to all the anti-war uh, sentiments and, yeah. and uh, you know, the moratorium marches and all that sort of thing. And then, and then next year in uniform, um, we had to be careful about, you know, how we carried ourselves in the public and all that sort of thing. But I never felt targeted at all. And Canberra, in one sense, was used to having the cadets there. Mm-hmm. There was a real sort of grudge, in a sense, between A and U students and the, and the cadets. But that sort of played itself out in the sporting field and a few other odd frivolities. But... Um, in Canberra, didn't censor that much. Um, when I later on in life, uh, 1979, I was the adjutant of Sydney University Regiment, and still then we didn't wear uniform when we went onto campus. Uh huh. So yeah, it, it was playing its way it out. It lingered on, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's playing its way out. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Mm. Now. If there was one thing you had the power to change during your time as Governor General, what do you think it would be? Oh, that's a big question. I know it is. It's like when people ask me, well, what's your favourite place in Australia? Um, in my, oh, I've been in, asked yeah, that one too. <laughs> yeah, in, in my job, there's no favourite. Uh, there's lots of favourites, uh, but there's no favourite. Yeah. Look, I think there is um, – so much we could do for uh, for youth in Australia who become disconnected, and yeah, you know, it's, it's almost trite to say they're our future, but they are. And so, helping kids who have stumbled at school, or you know, in some kids we've declared that they're not educatable, which is a terrible thing to say. So, yeah. attacking that, those sort of societal problems, uh, out of home care, foster care. Um, indigenous disengagement or not even disengagement, not being engaged as young people in our community um, and not opening doors for people. I often say, look, this is not about opening doors for people. It's showing people, young people, how many doors there are to open in life. And you are capable of opening any of those you put your mind to. But it requires hard work, it requires education and so on. Um, so if I could wave, wave my magic wand, I would sort of lift that generation, that younger generation up and give them the direction and the desire and the support they need to go out there and be themselves and get out of some of the sort of traps they find themselves in at the present time. Well, that's a wonderful aim indeed, and uh, I'd like to thank you very much for having a, ch- a chat on the Shed Wireless, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a very informative chat, and uh, like I said, it does show the Australian public that there's a lot more to your job than, uh, you know, just hosting VIP dinners, mm. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> they're the, they're the, uh, the, the least um, numerous uh, types of events we, uh, we hold, but... 
but they're important uh, because there's it's about our national engagement. But no, no. And if I could just say to the Menshed members, uh, that mm-hmm. last point I made about young people, I know that many are uh, inviting youngsters into the organisation into to see what they do, to teach them, you know, to give them some skills. I think that's really important work. Uh, that sort of outreach into the community to link with the younger generation, pass on knowledge, um, is really critical because there will be kids out there who live in families where no one owns a tool set. Yeah. You don't do the little jobs around the house and so forth. And uh, so engaging those kids from school, you don't you don't specifically target that group, but just getting kids in from school, you never know how that's going to play out in the future. I think that's a very good idea and I think that's something I might even put to the boss of the men's shed. It could be a, a nice little program to go ahead with. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. John, thank you very much for your time and, and best wishes to all the men's shedders out there. Shed Story. Let's find out more about our shed in the spotlight. It's time to put another Aussie shed in the spotlight. This shed has had a lot of involvement with youth programs, and I'm very excited about that. And it's a shed that happily exists with male and female participation. Bill Johnston is from the Fremantle Shed, For our overseas listeners, Fremantle is on the coast of Western Australia, not far from Perth, and happens to be my first landing spot when uh, my family emigrated to Australia back in 1962. So let's talk to Bill. Bill, what's happening in Frio at the moment? Uh, Well, in shed land you're talking about, really, I guess. Um, Yeah, uh, well, it's it's, uh, dynamic. Um, I think, you know, post-lockdown, as we've been pretty lucky here in the West, uh, you know, didn't have a very long period of the sort of the problems that you know, Melbourne or and even Sydney have had. Mm-hmm. So what's happened really is uh, the shed has sort of grown and expanded and continues to expand. Um, you know, it's been going since, uh, well, nearly 16, 17 years now, at Fremantle Men's Shed. So, um, uh, and it's now there's, um, you know, like over 300 members there. So it's getting, continuing to be ever popular. Mm. Yeah. So you were a founding member, Bill. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I sort of came back from a place called Nambucca Heads, which you know, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, after doing a bit of a – I was doing a research thing for the education department about what engages young guys, and um, I come across the shed at Nambucca Heads. My wife and I were on a bit of a, a camper band holiday as well, and I uh, thought I'd stay there for a day or two, and then I would start for an hour or two, but I'd end up staying a couple of days and seeing that they were working with a – local high school with kids who are disengaged and uh, I, that was of high interest to me. But also Nambucca is pretty close to, it was a sort of similar uh, thing to Fremantle. It's, it's you know, a seaside place where it's got a cohort of people who are from all sorts of walks of life, some really challenged and others are quite well off. So it, it struck me that it, you could almost transpose that model uh, to Frio. Uh, and so when I bought, you know, I like came back and told a couple of friends one being Alan Gallant, who's my closest friend, and he uh, is a carpenter. He said, well, this is a no-brainer, isn't it? Let's see if we can get a shed working in Frio. So we got a little uh, group of about 10 or 12 guys and, and founded the Frio Men's Shed. It took a long time to do that, of course, because no one had heard much about them here. Um, there were a couple of sheds in the country, you know, that, that had been going a long time. You know, they were sort of just for the local guys, and we just started, I think we probably did could claim having started the first uh, community men shed, community men shed. You know, like where all the guys are the members, and they decide on on what goes on, etc. Um, in WA, but yeah, so that's how it started. Was a little group of twelve, and yeah, you know, it was a long road to even get a building then, and we found a little one. So, um, do you want to hear a little about that as well? Or to... Yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, but yeah. before you go on about that, how did? Have you? Uh, do you have a program that involves youth over there? Yeah, we we, we do often uh, regularly. Uh, it, it, what we do is we regularly work with the PCYC, our Police and Citizens Youth Group, or we, we sometimes work with the school. That um, uh, and we also have a mentoring program that we work uh, with another. Some other sheds do as well with the Curtin University. There's a bit of a trial on how that can assist young guys who are challenged. We've got lots of various youth programs. That come and go in terms of like if the funding's there to run them, you know, because quite we generally have to like get a person that's 
you know, a professional. We have, have a when we do those sort of youth focused programs, we always make sure we've got somebody there who is a uh, you know is a, a highly highly qualified to work with kids A and B. You know, knows what what there needs to be taught in terms of skills, particularly if you're talking, working with wood or metal. So um, there's a bit of a cost factor involved in some of that. And then uh, often if it comes with a, a you know, grant, we'll get a grant for that sort of you know, mental health grant or something to help young kids. Yeah, we've worked with lots of various groups over a period of years, you know. That's really encouraging news. It yes. Uh, I, yeah, the one thing I'll have to give you a little anecdotal thing was when, when one of these kids walked in and uh, he was about, 13, I think I said, so um, where do you go to school? And he says, oh, I've retired. <laughs> <laughs> I've retired from school and I, we thought we've got a bit of building here to do. But um, my mate Alan, was, a, as I said, he was a carpenter. He also was a le- trade lecturer and, uh, you know, in the past life and he was really cl- great with these kids. He sort of like, like would give them, um, you know, like a, a thing like just say cut a piece of wood and then he'd talk about them. He'd say, oh, now cut across the diagonal or just, you know, measure across the diagonal. And he was teaching the maths, uh, app, you know, the application of maths in a practical sort of way. Of course. And, uh, you know, you don't re- they don't realise they're even learning it. You know, but they learn what a diagonal was. They learn how to use the tape measure properly. And uh, some of these kids, you know, were, were doing designs on this wood to teach them how to nail. You know, so they're getting a n- nail and Alan was showing them how you hit a nail in, hit the cleat nail in and, they would say, this is a stupid sort of thing. And suddenly they've got the whole idea and they'd be doing things like, um, you know, making those designs, actually Indigenous designs, uh, using the wood block, you know, using the nails as a, as a dot painting sort of thing, which yeah. is amazing, very creative. Uh, and a, a couple of those kids walked out of the, head, of the shed after the first day holding their wrists because they had tendonitis from nailing so much. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know. What is the, the the main project at the moment at the shed? Well, it, at the shed, we've got a number of uh, community projects going. Uh, um, one of the big ones is uh, is uh, recycling uh, booths or bins that uh, some of the councils are, are chasing. They're quite, you know, they're quite, you know, the three. They've got three, you know, uh, sections: one for plastics, one for sort of glass, and another one for. Uh, cardboards and papers, and um, a lot of councils are obviously putting these in private in the in the public spot. So to raise funds, we we help them with that. We make those. Uh, Fremantle uh, Council have been really good to us as well. So we what we do there is we have a, a weekly uh, clean team of these guys. We have a team of three or four guys go around each week uh, to the city centre, and they uh, they mark down or they record. Graffiti, uh, they clean up some graffiti if it's something that doesn't require a chemical, uh, you know, so it's take off stickers or something like that. But we uh, raise funds from, through the council, gives us a little contract to just report all the graffiti so their graffiti uh, experts can go by and, uh, you know, clean it all up, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, did, I should have mentioned too, too that we have um, uh, this, over 300 members, but of those, uh, you know, there'll be a 70 of them are women. So we've, we've, we've moved to embrace uh, the fact of having women in the shed. Wonderful. Yeah, and I think that's the, the path of the future. I, I, I was happy to go with what the flow was. I always felt it was important to include women in the shed in some way, but, you know, that wasn't how sheds were formed or the need was there for the guys to particularly have their own space, uh, and that doesn't change. But um, what we've done uh, is to, you know, work a timetable where there are certain times when... The guys have the shed all to themselves. Other times when uh, uh, is mixed groups, so guys and uh, women and men come together if they want to um, do that. Yeah. And then uh, there's a couple of times, one night a week in particular, it's a she shed, that's what they, they named it. So yeah. uh, it's on Thursday nights. And then there's a couple of, as I said, the other times they can come uh, with a, in a mixed group situation. So sort of trying to balance it out so everybody gets a, a access to it in the community and um, that's probably very popular beautiful um, Bill I, I thank you very much and I, I, I think that it sounds to me like the Frio shed is roaring ahead in uh, in every aspect um, it's a shame that the the dockers aren't doing the same yeah, yeah. And, uh, I'm the same with my Newcastle Knights so. yeah oh well there's always better days around the corner mate indeed there is indeed yeah, there yeah. is and I want to thank you very much for being a, a part of the shed wireless Bill no worries. Every success 
the uh, shed over there at Frio. It was successful with the podcast. All the best. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Got a question? Ask the doc. Professor Rob McLaughlin from AMSA Partners Healthy Mail. Over the past few episodes of The Shed Wireless, we've been talking about managing pain and finding out why the prescribing rules have changed for opioid pain medications. If you missed the past two editions of Ask the Doc, make sure you go back and have a listen, especially if you or someone you know suffers from chronic pain. As we've discovered, these opioid pain medications used to be prescribed quite commonly. But now, if you have longer term or chronic pain, your doctor will prescribe something else. This is the last one in our three-part series on this topic. This time, we're focusing on how to manage chronic pain without suffering in silence. Over to you, Professor Rob and Stuart. Thanks, JPY, and welcome, everyone. Quoting Thomas Edison, the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will instruct his patients in care of the human frame, in diet and in cause and prevention of disease. That's very pertinent for today. My name's Stuart Torrance. I'm the Men's Health Project Officer for the Australian Men's Shed Association. We're joined today by uh, Professor Rob McLaughlin, the Medical Director of Healthy Mail. How are the things in your world, Rob? Oh, pretty good, Stuart. Mate, over the last couple of episodes of Ask the Doctor, we've been learning about opioid-based pain medications, the regulation changes, the types of pain that respond to these medications, and the side effects. With all this, there is a risk that people will suffer in silence because of these regulatory changes. What do you think, Rob? Well, that's exactly what we need to look at. Uh, uh, the use of opiates and alternatives to their use to address chronic pain uh, because you know, people have this concern, they have pain, they have questions or use of these medications and uh, you know you talk about suffering in silence it's being stoic because putting up with it there's mm. really not much value in that because if you're battling a chronic pain it's going to run your batteries down you're going to sleep more poorly you're not going to feel energetic you're not going to enjoy your life and your family and friends and relationships can suffer you become sort of a bit grumpier or just a bit flat and not engaging so you might think you're putting up with it in silence but in fact people know that it's not you, there's something wrong. And so I'd like to you know, encourage us to, to talk about concerns of pain and the appropriate management, including opioids or alternatives to those, because pain's a terrible thing to have on a long-term basis. I totally agree. Let's look at some of those alternatives and we welcome another bloke to the conversation. Simon Holliday is a GP who focused a great amount of his professional life helping people manage their pain. How are you, Simon? Good, thank you. It's nice to be here. Simon, why does this topic matter? Uh, I think it's very important because pain is very common. Uh, we all have pain from time to time and about 20% of the population have pain pretty well all the time. And uh, you were talking about suffering in silence. Uh, and I think um, communication is really important with pain and sharing. In fact, the, the, when you look at the um, what goes on with the brain science, uh, a lot of the pain networks are to do with the socialization networks, how we relate to other people. Pleasure and pain go together, just as when we're in lockdown, we're isolated, we have a pain. And uh, when we communicate to people we talk to people i've got a pain we talk to people we feel better we actually can have reduce our pain or increase our pain threshold when we're in contact with other people so suffering in silence is not a good idea at all uh suffering more socially will reduce your suffering and we suffering is part of all of our lives and if we can um, learn to deal with our life in a better way, with less suffering, then we can have a happier and healthier life. I guess um, it's hard for people who have uh, heard of opioids or use them to think about an alternative because there's, there's this view or this perhaps this marketing that they're a, a great fixer, that, uh, that the use we can see from the, the use overseas and in Australia, they've been used more frequently and, uh, and so on. Uh, how do you go about... Uh, uh, a chat, tackling this long-held view that these sorts of strong medications are good for strong pain, the linking of the two. Well, I think we just need to stick to the science. Opiates are fantastic medications when people are, are dying. Um, thank God we've got them. Uh, for end-of-life care, when people are worried, their bones are breaking, they can't breathe, they're distressed. We give people opiates and they fix all their problems. They're also fabulous medications when we're doing surgery or if somebody has a traumatic injury, 
uh, in a very short-term sense. But I think we need to recognise that we don't have science to say that opiates are either effective or safe in long-term pain. And when you think about uh, opiates, uh, we start off with opium, and that's been around for millennia. And then we, uh, um, in the early 19th century, developed morphine and then heroin and codeine in the later in the 19th century. And uh, even in Britain today, heroin is a, a prescribed pharmaceutical. So there's not much difference between heroin and opium and codeine and fentanyl and Oxycontin. And I think if people understand, if you take heroin, if you think about it, if you took heroin every day for 40 years for your bad back, you're not actually going to be living a happy and healthy life. You're not going to have a great back. Um, and so once people understand that all these things, it's, we're not talking about morality, we're just talking about science. So, I mean, can we now look at the what um, alternatives there are to these opioid medications? Yeah, look, I think Thomas Edison uh, that you quoted at the beginning um, had a light bulb moment. Uh, and uh, I think what he said is exactly what I'd like to say to you. And I think uh, pharmaceuticals, by and large, are pretty disappointing with chronic pain, and we know that. And if we're looking at an outcome like 50% uh, of reduction of chronic pain, we know that um, very few of all the pharmaceuticals we use will give, give you that. And we need to often treat 8 or 10 or 15 people to get one person with a reduction of their pain by 50%. So we need to, uh, even though doc, uh, a lot of doctors' education comes from pharmaceutical companies, it's a massive industry, the marketing is very strong, we need to actually look away from pharmaceuticals and think more like Thomas Edison and look at holistic care and looking at what it is that people can do to relieve the suffering in their life. And there's lots of things we can do. And the first thing is to stop making things worse with well-intentioned short-term fixes like opiates. Um, and the same would go for um, other uh, addictive substances. So when people drink a skin full of beer, they they wash away, they, they, they uh, drown their pain and their sorrow. Uh, you know, tobacco, they have a smoke, they feel a bit better. Uh, it might be that their um, people use cocaine for, for um, in not in rural areas because it's too expensive there. It's only in cities. But there's lots of substances that people will use, uh, legal or illegal. And I think we've got to get away from that and get back to a healthy lifestyle. So uh, thinking, looking at people's thinking is really important. And that's uh, can be done with your healthcare professional, your GP or your psychologist. And if people, for example, we have uh, black and white thinking I, I, and catastrophic thinking, it's called. So where people say, if I don't get my pain relief, I'm um, not going to be able to keep working. I'll lose my job. We won't pay the mortgage. Our family will be in the street. My wife will leave me. My kids will be um, abused. Uh, I must have my opiates because this is this is directly going to happen straight away. So this is a um, unhelpful thought, and this is where someone has got to look at their way they're thinking and how we feel. We know that depression is a real driver of pain, and so if someone is depressed, they've got to have deal with that and you can deal with that with a pharmaceutical non-pharmaceutical fashion and then what we're doing is really important what we're doing how we're sleeping so if you have good better if we look at improving people's sleep they'll find that they their experience of pain is a, is a lot more um, satisfactory their suffering is less and also um, physical activity like doing ex stretching and exercise and keeping fit and uh, looking at what we eat having a rubbish diet uh, is not good for our arteries around our heart because it causes inflammation in those arteries, but also is not good for the structures around our nerves. So having a rubbish diet will give you uh, inflamed nerves and those nerves will be more twitchy and uh, give more pain signals. So looking at your diet as well as obesity is really important. And then we've talked about social things and that can be either in your workplace, with your family, with your uh, intimate partner. These things are all very important for your pain management. Simon, I, I looked uh, looked on the, uh, I did a Google search on pain and uh, I came across some very interesting sites uh, and some very interesting programs. And I, I saw one for, by uh, Dr. Chris Van Tolken uh, and his uh, caption is the doctor who gave up drugs. He was using things like cold water swims uh, to overcome depression because it activates the, the neurons in the brain. Uh, he talked about 
doing yoga, uh, light yoga programs for, for things. Are these are the sort of alternatives that we, we should be looking at, uh, looking outside the scope of medicine uh, and looking to what we can do personally for our own bodies, i.e. you mentioned diet and exercise. Uh, I think they're very pertinent. Look, I don't want to do myself out of a business here. Uh, you know, this is... Uh, <laughs> But I think to a degree, we've got to move away from um, the management of chronic pain being something that doctors are controlling. Um, and much as we like to control things and be the center of the universe and uh, and uh, get people to pay their bill on the way out, that's not the answer for people with chronic pain, especially when it's 20% of the population and then most of us having pain from time to time. So we actually think we're actually talking about um, self-management and active self-management where people actually start to regain control and stop being controlled by pharmaceuticals or actually by waiting for a doctor to wave the magic scalpel or um, the, write the magic script uh, to fix their pain. And because um, when you've had, when people have had pain for months or decades, the chance of somebody coming along with a magic scalpel or a magic script fixing them is really um, unlikely. Yeah. So, I mean, I know you've got to go. You've got to run a COVID vaccine clinic, and um, that's very important. We thank you very much for that. So, Rob, what would you do in regards to uh, maybe tackling someone's chronic pain? How would you do yours? That's an easier question, and although it's difficult also, always think about yourself. I would take from this, don't be simple about it by thinking, you know, it's in a bottle. The fix is in a bottle. It's a bottle of opioids. It's not. It's more complicated. I have to look at, first of all, I have to talk about it. I have to share the problem with my family or my GP and then think broadly about it. What is it that is stopping me from being happy? Is it just the pain or the other things happening? Am I sleeping well? Uh, personally, we join a community choir. That makes me happy. All sorts of things you can do to make your circumstances better and the pain will get less. But it's not a simple question of coming out of a bottle. That's what I take from this. Fantastic. Rob, once again, been great talking to you. It's been great chatting with Simon. It's, uh, it's always great to uh, get together on um, Ask the Doctor. Thank you very much, one and all, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Stuart. For a great range of resources and tools to help you live well, head to the Spanner in the Works website. You can just search it up or go to mailhealth.org.au. Everything you hear on The Shed Wireless is created to inform and is not intended to be a substitute for personal advice from your doctor. Well, a big thanks to the crew. You just heard from Dr. Simon Holliday, Professor Rob McLaughlin from Healthy Mail and Stuart Torrance from the Australian Men's Shed Association. By the way, to mark Men's Health Week here in Australia, we're going to release a couple of bonus Ask the Doc podcast playbacks. Try saying that with a mouthful of marbles. So make sure you hit subscribe on your phone or computer. Then they'll just pop up on your device when they become available. The first podcast playback covers erectile dysfunction. This was a seriously worthwhile edition of Ask the Doc we recorded way back in Series 2. The second one is about the shocks of ageing. They're quite short and they're packed with useful information. Both of them are hosted by Aaron Carney and Professor Rob. So I hope you enjoy listening to those too. Now it's time to talk fishing with Butch. Well, the last time we spoke to Butch, we did give a hint that we were going to talk about doing some fishing things with your grandkids. And Butch is right here, right now. So what's the, the best way to involve the kids in I, fishing? Yeah, yeah. Th thanks for inviting me again, John. Uh, I think the best way to get the kids interested in fishing, or one of the best ways, is gathering bait. Uh -huh. If you remember back in the day, you, your dad probably took you out the back garden or somewhere with a, you know, with a spade and grab some worms out of there. How much fun was that? Fact, the first time I ever went fishing of any kind was in Glasgow oh. uh, with a, a little a little net yep. on, a, on a stick yep. and, uh, and skimming the water for, uh, for tadpoles and yeah. anything that was in the water. You're just trying to grab it. Yeah. Yep. yeah, well, that's it. That's what I'm getting at. So if you're inland, for example, you can go to some, somebody's farm and catch those yabbies, those freshwater yabbies. So, mm. And kids just love that. All you need is a piece of string, a bit of meat on the end, throw it in and wait for them to grab it and then just pull on the string. You just bring them in slowly, get a little net, put it under the yabby and you've got them. I've heard that um, 
Yabbies are actually vegetarians. That's tr- that's and, correct. Uh, and the reason why they grab onto the meat is because they want it away from them. That, that That's supposedly the theory. But yeah. the funny thing is all those crustaceans seem to like meat. For example, if you're up in the tropics and you're catching, say, live cherubim, which are a live inland prawn, mm-hmm. we, we used to use um, meat that you would use for pet food. In other words, even dry pet food, you know, mm. And you just put that in as bait in your trap. And they would go for that. And other people would put soap, soap, yep. and that would work. So there's something in the soap, uh, some some sort of fat. oil fat. Yeah. Fat, but remember yeah. when we went fishing up in uh, like uh, Tinaru and yes. we were getting those red claw. And remember yes. the guide said, forget all that, we'll just put pumpkin in. That's remember? True. And he used pumpkin. Yeah. And and the good thing about getting them with pumpkin, they didn't eat much, but they still come into the trap. So that that's the vegetarian part of it. Right. But anyhow, getting back to gathering bait in, in inland, so you've got things like grasshoppers too. People, you know, yep. kids running around with a net catching catching grasshoppers. Yeah. How good is that? You know, and crickets. And they'll catch everything, trout, uh, mullet, all that sort of stuff. Yep. And then if you're if you're on the ocean side anywhere, you know, where there's a beach or something, I'd I'd be looking at getting them catching beach worms. Now I've never caught one myself, <laughs> but there are experts out there. And if you show a bit of interest, somebody you'll see someone on a beach waving a, a stocking around on the water, and you'll go up and it'll be all smelly, and you'll think, "What are you doing?" And they'll say, "Oh, we're getting beach worms." If you get your grandkids down there, they'll just love that. They'll just watch the guy pulling these beach worms out, hmm. and if they get good at it, they can do it themselves. And of course, in estuaries, uh, there's the uh, the everlasting prawn. Oh, absolutely! How much fun is that prawning? At yeah. night, eh? Hey? Yeah. As kids. Well, not even as kids. I mean, later oh, on. Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the, the thrill of the catch never leaves you, even though it's a tiny little prawn. <laughs> it's, it's just, got it! <laughs> <laughs> and there's also, you're likely to get a, you know, a couple of blue swim crabs or a couple of squid. But the good thing about these days is, for kids, you could do that just waiting. And these days with LED headlight torches, you don't have to have those complicated kerosene lamps we used to use. Indeed. We used to pump them up. They were yep. really awkward and heavy and they, they were dangerous. Mm. But now you just buy an LED lamp for Bunnings or somewhere, stick it on the kid's head, yep. turn it on, and you've got instant light. Yep. You need a, a, a broad broad uh, sweep of light mm. and it needn't be powerful. Yep. You can always see them because you see the, the, their little eyes blinking with the reflection of the light in their pink eyes, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. Now, what else is uh, – so we've done insects, prawns – um, We've got yabbies. freshwater yabbies. Now we're talking about pink nippers, which are the saltwater yabbies yep. that you pump up. Mm-hmm. Remember that? You just yes. pump them up and then you squirt the squirt them out and the kids run around picking the pink nippers up. Yeah, and you, but you've got to check your, uh, your local rules for that because some Absolutely. places you aren't yeah. allowed to pump for yeah. yabbies. I know Sydney Harbour, for example, is totally right. banned, but it's totally banned worms, everything. You're not allowed to take anything for intertidal zone in Sydney Harbour. But most other places you're allowed to. So, okay. yeah, you're right. Check check where you can. Yep. But pumping pumping those pink nippers is so much fun. And and the, and you get the worms come out, the squirt worms, all that sort of stuff. Yep. So, yeah. I, I, all you need is to buy a pump too. I mean, yep. there you go. And then anywhere knee deep water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, especially in summertime, you know, because that's yeah. that is the the yeah. best time to to go bait collecting, and when it's not well, too chilly. Yeah, and not only that, but a lot of those pink nippers and stuff go dormant, and they go deeper, and they don't come up. So, and not only that, but the fish that are feeding on those sort of things, they don't feed on those in winter. They mm-hmm. go into deeper water. Right. So your whiting and your brim, and the and your trevally and all those sort of things that come into the you know into the shallow water looking for pink nippers and worms. Forget it in winter. They go into deeper water, uh-huh. which is a whole new kettle of fish, so to speak. And, of course, you can always use garden worms. Absolutely. 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 The only thing about garden worms in the salt is they do die. They die pretty quickly. Uh-huh. But they still look like a worm, so therefore they're likely to work, you know. Yeah. I've caught brim and whiting on garden worms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've sort of covered that. Now, we'll, we'll sign off for this week. In our next little chat, yep. seeing as it is winter time, it is. We'll talk about some winter fish and uh, and winter fishing. Okay, fantastic. Okay, thanks again, Butch. That's okay. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. With Rip Wood Chip. Hey!
Hey, shadows, rip wood chip here. How you all going today? I'm just out chopping some kindling to get the fire going inside. It's starting to get bloody cold down here now. Yep, summer is well and truly gone. And the older I get, the more the cold affects me and the harder it is to adjust. I can understand why so many folks head north this time of year, chasing the sun. It gets that bloody cold down here some years, you could fart snowflakes. I realise that all the seasons have their own assets and liabilities, but winter's definitely got to be my least favourite. I hate getting out of my warm bed of a morning and spend most of the day looking forward to getting back into it. It takes me an hour just to get the joints moving and my body going in orderly fashion just to put the kettle on. It's like trying to start the old Fergie TE20 back in the day. I guess I don't mind cuddling up to the missus by the fire of a night with a glass of red wine, but that's about all that's good about it. I spent most of the winter looking forward to the spring. Yep, spring suits this old codger down to a tee. It's always been my favourite. It's literally like a breath of fresh air when it hits and a good reminder that you survived another winter. And you can come out of hibernation and get outside and defrost the extremities. And then summer comes along and you're out battling the elements of a different kind and sweating like a sumo wrestler in a sauna. I do love going for a swim every other day though and soaking up the sun, roaming around in me thongs and budgie smugglers. It's like recharging the batteries. But the next thing you know, it's autumn again. And autumn's gnaw your arse or your elbow, really. It cools down a bit, but after spending six months of the year and thousands of bucks on fertilising and getting the yard just right, you have to watch it all start to fall apart around your ears as it all goes to weed again. It's certainly a colourful time of year, though. I'll grant you that. I guess it could be worse, though. We could be like the Darwinites. They only have two seasons, wet and dry. Ah, there's just no pleasing some people, is there? But having the farm all my life, the season's dictated everything. Now it just means the difference between eating stews or salads, wearing a singlet or a skivvy, boots or bare feet. But it's the changes that make it all not so boring and make you appreciate what each has to offer, I suppose. I guess I'd even get sick of 12 months of spring. So I guess I should stop me bloody whinging and pull me thermals down from the top of the cupboard and just enjoy it for what it is. Ah, bugger it. Pack your bags, love. We're going to Cairns. Well, that's it for this episode of The Shed Wireless. We're about to close the door. We're going to sign off. That's it. Speak to you next time. Bye. It don't matter if you work with wood Or fabricating metal is the thing you understood Whatever is your game, everyone's the same Yeah, we can do it all Shed. Short, fat, tall, skinny, hairy, ball. In the shed, it's welcome one and all Share the skills you know, we're all having a go There's a helping hand in the bench shed Yeah.